Well, welcome everybody to another of HydroTerra's webinars. Today, the topic is the transect approach to characterizing and monitoring dissolved contaminant plumes. We're very fortunate to have Murray Ineson, who's the practice leader for contaminated site management at Haley Aldridge. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a picture of Murray and myself. A little bit about our presenter today. So I've been chatting to Murray obviously before this, so I can add a little bit to this. But Murray is originally born in Canada, but has spent most of his career in the US. Today, he's beaming in from Oregon, which the temperature is at about 35 degrees and pretty humid. So we're lucky to have Murray here uh, late at night and uh, really appreciate that. Um, Murray Ineson is an internationally known contaminant hydrogeologist based in the United States. He obtained his graduate degree at the University of Waterloo under Dr. John Cherry. Many of you have, may have seen John Cherry when he came to Australia, I think it's probably six years ago now, a, a real industry uh, legend really in hydrogeology. He has authored more than 20 peer-reviewed papers, including a book chapter on multi-level groundwater monitoring. He is also the co-inventor of the CMT multi-level monitoring system sold by Solenst. In honour of his innovations, the National Groundwater Association awarded Murray its Technology Award in 2009. I first I uh, was introduced to Murray uh, electronically when I went to Solonst earlier this year. Um, we have regular training at Solonst and they bring everyone together. Well, it's sort of meant to be annually. COVID interrupted that. But Murray did a fantastic presentation and we thought it would be great to get him involved in the webinar series to present on the topic that he is today. Before we get started, we love your questions and it's fantastic to have so many people on here today. To raise a question, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and I will read out those questions at the end of the webinar. Why does HydroTerra undertake these webinars? Well, we're passionate about sharing knowledge and we like to facilitate education and we like to take a leadership position in industry. And it's fantastic to have you all here today. Without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Murray's going to share at his end to commence this presentation. All right. All right, can you see that okay? Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Richard. Uh, very happy to participate in this educational event. So my topic today is the transect approach to characterizing and monitoring dissolved contaminant plumes. And it's a, an approach that was born in applied research, but it's being increasingly used at real sites, at commercial sites uh, to um, delineate dissolved contamination in the subsurface um, with a minimum of one transect, but uh, often multiple transects to uh, examine how the plume chemistry is changing along the flow path. And it is a high resolution approach, but uh, what's um, special about it is by installing um, networks of, of engineered multi-level systems along the transects, 
that facilitates high resolution temporal monitoring. And that's what's missing now in the whole suite of high resolution tools and technologies is we do all this great work uh, to, to, um, to delineate contaminants in the subsurface, but then we monitor them, monitor plumes with 40 year old technology that is highly biased. So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit and, um, and show you the solutions that, that I and many others are using. So this really started our field of contaminant hydrogeology started uh, in the 1970s. Um, in fact, I think 1972 was the year that our president in the US, Richard Nixon, signed the Clean Water Act. And that created a lot of rules and regulations, including the start of uh, the Superfund legislation, but it also created the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. And they were charged with um, preventing contamination to groundwater, but then also investigating and cleaning up contaminant plumes. And they didn't even know about NAPL, non-aqueous phase liquids, back in 1972. That came later, but um, their goal was to clean up plumes. The only problem is nobody knew what a plume was. Nobody had done any research into what groundwater contaminant plumes looked like. There was a lot of research um, you know, during the 70s and prior to that on, on water resources and physical hydrogeology, but nothing about contaminant hydrogeology. So the uh, US EPA needed to write guidance documents. And here is actually a figure from a, a 1989 guidance document from US EPA. And this is what they thought a plume looked like. And um, they borrowed or they used an analog from, uh, um, from two other types of contaminants. So um, uh, particulate matter emit, emitted from smoke stacks, stacks from manufacturing facilities, so air, uh, airborne pollutants, and then also uh, pollutants that were discharged to surface water bodies like streams and rivers. And in both of those two environments, you have um, um, rapid movement of the fluids and you have hydrodynamic mixing. So you get robust mixing in air and in surface water systems. Groundwater, however, moves very slowly below the threshold uh, Reynolds number required for hydrodynamic uh, mixing for turbulent flow. It's laminar flow. And so with laminar flow, you don't get the robust mixing that you get in those other environments. So this analog was based on other contaminants, not groundwater. Nobody knew what, how uh, contaminants moved in groundwater. And then you see this like shotgun blast of black dots those were, um, you know, the, the kind of conceptualized best practice for putting in monitoring wells to try to, you know, try to replicate this diagram. So that's how this whole industry was born, uh, based on analogs from other contaminants that are not like groundwater contaminants. And, um, you know, good intentions, but it, it started us on a path of um, incorrect um, and expensive and um, uh, in, indecisive, uh, you know, modeling or, or depictions of dissolved plumes in the subsurface. And this is a legacy that has lasted for 40 years because this style of monitoring with, you know, putting in monitoring, inter monitoring wells all over uh, and then contouring the data is still really prevalent in North America. I hope it's not quite so prevalent in Australia, but it might be. So um, the re one of the reasons why this was accepted is that we didn't have technologies in the 1980s to do depth discrete sampling to actually figure out what the true distribution of contaminants were in the subsurface. We borrowed technologies from the water resources industry, um, basically you know, minute, you know, water supply wells, and we made them smaller and in smaller diameters. And then we called them monitoring wells. But for all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same as a water supply well, but just miniaturized. I worked at a consulting firm in the 1980s. I would call the driller up uh, and we were all putting in monitoring wells because like, what else do you do? You know, you don't, you know, we didn't know what else to do. We just put in monitoring wells. It was a heyday for monitoring wells. You call the driller and the driller says, would you like a good well? And it's like, I'm, you know, in my 20s and of course I want a good well. 
And what a good, mal good well meant was that they would put a well in with long well screens, um, sometimes you know, 10, 20, 30 meters of well screens in order to get good flow. So that was the definition of a good monitoring well. But with a single interval monitoring well, you're getting blended samples, like seven issues slash problems with samples from conventional monitoring wells. They're blended. They're strongly biased by ambient vertical flow within the wells. There's a really excellent paper from 2001 by um, researchers at Clemson. And I've reproduced this in a sidebar in my um, in my book chapter, the Nielsen chapter, that just dramatically shows what happens when you have even a teeny tiny vertical gradient, but then you you eliminate the um, the uh, resisting forces vertically uh, by putting in a monitoring well. And in this little diagram, it shows a simulated contaminant plume flowing in, you know, flowing horizontally until it reaches a monitoring well, which has no resistance to vertical flow. And yet, then you have flow up the well and out of the well bore. And so this, in the study I cite in this, happened at 70% of the test wells that these Clemson researchers investigated. Holy moly, is that ever significant? And so ver even small vertic vertical gradients can create this condition. And vertical gradients aren't constant in magnitude or even direction seasonally. So you've got you know, really big biases by ambient vertical flow. It results in these really scattered plots of concentration over time that are kind of illegible. And then we use complex statistical methods to try to tease out some kind of a trend. It can overstate the depth of contamination because if you're putting in a well down to 100 meters um, and maybe the contamination is at 14 meters, you have to assume it extends down to 100 meters because you don't know otherwise. That's how deep your well is. Um, it can understate the maximum concentration in the aquifer because, again, it's a highly blended sample. It's completely inappropriate for designing and monitoring in situ remedies like reactive barriers. You need to know the actual maximum concentrations. Otherwise, you'll get breakthrough through a reactive barrier if you don't know the true concentration distribution. And then finally, if these weren't bad enough, you know, putting in these conduits of long screen monitoring wells can uh, result in cross-contamination of aquifers. So if my opinions about conventional wells aren't really clear by now, I'm not a big fan of them, which led me to look for alternatives and think up some clever ways to do um, high resolution vertical sampling again and again with, um, you know, with uh, engineered multi-level monitoring systems. Um, this is a really good book chapter. Um, it is available. I, I have a little uh, reference for it coming up. Um, so, so what happened? In the 1970s, 1980s, um, it really is John Cherry, the professor that um, I studied under, was very curious about what contamination was like in the subsurface, realized that we had no idea what the, about the scale of processes that were going on in the subsurface, and um, got a new position at University of Waterloo which was uh, you know, 150 kilometers away from the Canadian face base Borden, which is a military base with a really nice sandy aquifer. And he uh, convinced the Canadian government to allow him and his students to release contaminants to the Borden aquifer and then monitor those contaminants in, in extremely great detail. And he said, and people said, Dr. Cherry, why so detailed monitoring? And he said, I don't know the scale that's relevant. So I, I need to err on the side of over monitoring and then we're gonna learn a lot and then we can adjust the scale of monitoring. Um, Canadians were able to do this and Americans were not, guess why? Because the US EPA prohibited universities from doing controlled release experiments in the United States because they were a new agency. They were empowered to prevent contamination and it, you know, it was like over my dead body are you gonna release contaminants on purpose, you know, what are you smoking? And so the Canadians didn't have that constraint. And so, you know, the Canadians at University of Waterloo beat everyone in the world by decades in, in terms of the scope and quantity and uh, knowledge gained from controlled release experiments. And they have to be controlled because you need to know the amount of mass that you're adding to the subsurface in order to do any kind of mass balance um, kinds of calculations.
And I'm not kidding that these were monitored in incredible detail. This is just one of the monitoring networks downgradient of these controlled release sites. It's even more impressive slash sobering if you realize that ever at every one of these locations, there's 10 different adept discrete monitoring wells. Uh, these are referred to as bundle posometers, which were very inexpensive, and they worked fine because the sand collapsed around them. If the sand didn't collapse around them, you could not uh, install wells this way, but fortunately they could do this. It brings up another important point, is, and that is uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and they needed inexpensive mon multi-level monitoring technology, so it's no con coincidence that the Solent's uh, the Waterloo system, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and the CMT system were born out of uh, applied research projects at Base Borden by Dr. Cherry and his colleagues. Here's just a plan view map of a, uh, of a plume that migrates down gradient in the Borden aquifer. This was a research project funded by the American Petroleum Institute. Um, Dr. Jim Barker was the principal investigator, and they released um, plumes of um, of they released groundwater to the subsurface that contained uh, petroleum hydrocarbon products that were in equilibrium with the water that they had extracted. So each of them had you know 1,500 different petroleum hydrocarbon compounds, along with in this case MTBE. This just had gasoline. This would this one had methanol. And this is based. This is work that was done uh, because the in the U.S. Uh, the EPA was calling for lead to be removed from gasoline, and that, and so without lead, you needed a different oxygenate. So the API funded this applied research. Uh, Dr. Barker gave a presentation to EPA about his experimental design. Somebody in the back held up his hand and said, Dr. Barker, I think you've forgotten a fundamental um, um, component of your of this of this research project. You don't. Why don't you have uh, sheet piling? That it, why aren't you installing sheet piling to keep the plumes separate? And Dr. Barker just kind of smiled and said, I don't think we need them. And he, and he knew that because he'd done previous research at the site and, and knew that these plumes weren't going to do this. They're not going to all commingle and become one big, you know, fan-shaped plume. So again, this was the early insights that plumes are not like the diagram that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. This is what that benzene plume looked like. Three benzene plumes, they're not commingled after day 106, after day 317, after 18 months. They're still not commingled. They haven't spread apart laterally or vertically. They have elongated. So longitudinal transverse dispersion is real because of variations in the groundwater flow velocity, but they don't move, um, they don't spread out too much laterally. So me as a consultant working on litigation projects with the corner gas station sites, all of the attorneys just assume that it's one hopeless commingle plume. But if you do a detailed uh, direct push sampling, especially along transects, you can often determine that the plumes actually look like this. So um, Barker and his crew were struggling with a way to kind of quickly convey what's going on in the subsurface. They did maps with different layers of contaminants. And then they just started drawing cross sections orthogonal or perpendicular to the dissolved plumes and just called them transects. And that's what this is. So you can see that this is that Southern plume of, you know, of benzene. Here's the benzene in the, in the middle plume. Here's benzene in the, the Northern plume. There's clean water between them. So they're not commingled. Um, and then you can also see what's missing in the aquifer, in this case, dissolved oxygen. Uh, which is being used up in the biodegradation of these different petroleum hydrocarbons. So the reason I want to mention this is because this was the standard way of, of monitoring plumes in applied research until like 1996. Then Barker and others just started presenting the data at conferences along transects, and pretty much they stopped presenting data any other way and just started uh, presenting transects because it was so clear um, what's going on, and then especially you can draw these along multiple um, distances away from the plume. So this trend picked up in uh, the U.S. and in Denmark uh, and in other places with applied research. This is a, 
project I worked on with Dr. Doug McKay at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where we released different compounds to look at the, um, uh, the effects of ethanol on petroleum hydrocarbons. But what you're looking, like, looking at here are just these two cute little bromide uh, plumes that we created by injecting a solution of bromide into two monitoring wells, one here and one here. And then we monitored it in detail along the flow path using, guess what, transects. So we just use transects. So, and that was very useful. And look at these little plumes. They're not spreading out here at Vandenberg at a US site, just like they didn't spread out at the Canadian site. And then one thing I really want to share, and I'll get back to later, is that we turned off the um, the bromide after a while. I think it was at day, um, you know, just after 250 days, and then we just watched and monitored the bromide elute or or uh, dis, you know or flow down gradient as it goes away. So having permanent multi-level monitoring, set, you know, arrays like this allowed us to actually document that the plume is migrating away. Or in the case of an in-situ remediation system, it's actually being remediated. Or maybe there's a new release. You're only able to, um, to determine that if you have a monitoring network that you, can that you can revisit and collect samples over time. And you currently can't do that with the whole wonderful array of direct push tools that are available, but you can do it with engineered multi-level monitoring systems, which is what was used at this uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base site. Um, 2005, Dr. Cherry and his colleagues, Beth Parker, Martin Gilbo, John was sick and tired of hearing people in the audience saying, well, Dr. Cherry, those we see what you're saying and we believe you, but you have research plumes. We have real plumes and our plumes don't behave like your uh, well-mannered research plumes. So he got funding to go out to three or four different actual uh, release sites in, in the eastern seaboard of, of the United States and, and use transects of direct push sampling tools, down gradient of known contaminant release areas. This one is in Cocoa, Florida, uh, but there was um, some others in, um, in different parts of, of the eastern U.S. And so the next picture I'll show you is what this cross section looks like. And so that's, you know, a vertical profile of um, of TCE, so very, very low, 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 and then just, you know, five centimeters deeper, you know, you're up at, you know, 60 milligrams per liter. So really sharp contrast in the, um, in the depth of contamination. And then when you plot that in a cross section, you can see that there's actually three different plume cores. And that actually agreed with what they knew about the releases that there was actually three different release sites which created three concentrated plumes or plume cores. And what I really like about that publication is it's now, um, it's replaced or supplanted the that early di <clears throat> diagram from US EPA, that cartoon with a, a much better cartoon of what uh, a source area looks like with, so with depleted D-napple, groundwater flowing through and over and around these uh, residual napple zones and creating these highly concentrated plume cores um, that are nicely depicted all on, on a transect like this. So I think this is one of the most important publications yet this millennium in terms of putting all of this together and just showing how plumes are created and then the benefits of monitoring them uh, at high resolution. You could not afford, and this is kind of, I would never sample all of these locations at a real site, but you can, this doing transect monitoring makes high resolution plume monitoring affordable because you're not doing this all over the plume. You're doing it at, you know, two or three or four different locations. And I have a, a case study that I'll share with you a little later on. So this is, you know, fortunately now, you know, at least for some people who read the technical journals and all that, it's really replaced this early cartoon this erroneous conceptualization of what we thought plumes looked like in the 1970s. So transects of closely spaced direct push samples or multi-level wells uh, have a lot of advantages. And again, this is just kind of conceptually what that looks like in a block diagram, what that looks like in a, in a cross section, and then um, what it looks like in a spreadsheet. And I'll get to this here in a, in a couple slides. But what I like about it 
And what everybody likes about it is you're just making sure you're not missing something. There's no part of the plume that's escaping detection. You're actually identifying the high strength cores, plume cores, and you know what the actual concentrations are. So if you're putting in a permeable reactive barrier, you might be able to focus in just a very small part of the plume with your PRB, which uh, makes it much, much more economical. Um, you're monitoring groundwater of about the same age. Um, when we're monitoring with arrays of monitoring wells, we were uh, monitoring, you know, in, you know, water that or plume that was created 30 years ago out here and maybe three years ago over here. Um, so uh, it's it's really a benefit to, to be monitoring groundwater that's about the same age. And then uh, another reason why these are really valuable is it shows where the concentrations are truly low and that they're not low or non-detect because of uh, blending or dilution in monitoring wells. I worked on a big litigation project in Southern California where there was MTBE and toluene and other, a bunch of stuff being detected in a water supply well. And so the regulatory agency immediately pointed their fingers at half a dozen gas stations upgrading it of the municipal well and said, one of you has to have a release of MTBE. You know, you need to find out who it is and start remediating it. And uh, my firm was hired uh, and we did transects with multi-level wells like this. And we started just seeing low concentrations everywhere of MTBE and benzene and all kinds of stuff. And around that time, the US Geological Survey published a report titled, you know, widespread occurrence of low level VOCs from artificial recharge operations in the Santa Ana River. So it was a regional phenomenon and, it, and we were confident in the data that we have that, that the 17 parts per billion wasn't really, you know, 2,500 parts per billion that was diluted in a long screen monitoring well. So that's a real advantage also. Um, there, I mentioned this early on, uh, there is still, you know, it's, it's getting a little long in the tooth, but I think it's still the most, sorry, the most comprehensive and complete guide for uh, ground, multi-level groundwater monitoring technologies is that chapter number 11 in this, uh, this book by uh, Nielsen. And um, so it's a good read and there's about 50 pages of content talking about biases in monitoring wells and then the alternatives for uh, engineered multi-level monitoring systems. Um, you can do higher resolution multi-level monitoring with conventional wells. And this in that book chapter, I show well clusters that um, are um, separate wells in separate well bores, um, and then nested wells, which are multiple casings in a single well bore. Those are two common alternatives. Um, nested wells, I don't like. I worked on a lot of sites early in my career with nested wells. And while the design shows a nicely separated array of pipes in a single borehole, in reality, no boreholes are perfectly plumb or straight. And, um, and then often the, the pipes are laying up against one against another and there's leakage uh, between um, you know, the pipes and you get cross-contamination in the, in the well bore. What tips you off usually is that the water levels in these three pipes are all the same. And that suggests that there's kind of interconnection. Well clusters also, you can have unintended consequences if the, uh, there's some overlap in the screens, you can get cascading plumes if you've got vertical gradients. And then also um, these cost a lot more money because you're drilling a lot more borehole to put in um, you know, multiple wells or, uh, and, and well casings. So engineered multi-level monitoring systems, there's four that are commercially available. Uh, the water flute system, the West Bay system developed in Western Canada, and then these two here, uh, Solence CMT and the Solence Waterloo system. This one, I think I mentioned, you know, was uh, the first one uh, that uh, Waterloo developed and Solence then licensed it, licensed it and continues to sell it. There's about a thousand that have been installed to date. And then the CMT system that was developed and uh, publicized in 2001, there's six to maybe 7,000 of those now that are installed in different parts of the world. Um, I'll talk about this one first, and it's a clever idea uh, with um, with uh, PVC casing that is all joined together with watertight tight joints, and then a little port um, that goes out of the side of the um, of one of these fittings, 
And then there's tubing that connects to that fitting that runs up to the surface. So um, you can just basically collect water samples from the tubing. You can measure, measure water pressures inside the tubing. And uh, I, um, I think installed the first one, the first multi-level system in California 40 years ago, and it was a Waterloo system at a waste management land, landfill in Bakersfield, California. Uh, and there's a lot of really good information on the, the uh, Solent's website about the Waterloo system. Um, and and Solent's does really a great job of supporting this product and improving it since I did that installation nearly 40 years ago. Uh, CMT, again, near and dear to my heart, continuous extrusions of polyethylene tubing um, up to 50 meters. And it's inexpensive because it's just a single extrusion of, of tubing. Uh, two different sizes. One facilitates three different um, uh, sampling zones. The larger one facilitates seven different ones. This, there's one in the center, and that's always the bottom port. And then a publication from 2001 describing the system. And then a diagram on the Solence website, which is a, a really great source of information, just showing the cutout of the channel. You basically figure out where you want to have a port. There's a tool to cut out the external sheath of the tubing. Uh, you seal the tubing, uh, the channel below that depth and wrap a little bit of uh, stainless steel screen around it, and uh, then you're good to go. So um, a nice summary uh, table on Solus website. The big difference is it's 300 meters, uh, at least with the Waterloo system, compared to 50 meter uh, maximum recommended depth with the CMT tubing, applicable in both overburden and bedrock. Uh, but up to 24 different sampling zones with the Waterloo system, and you're li limited to up to uh, seven in CMT with the CMT. Believe it or not, I've known consultants who put in CMT systems and have only used one channel. You know, go figure, you know. And then they put lots of ports at different depths. So, what what are they thinking? Um, back to this diagram, I think I mentioned these advantages, but there's one other here that makes these transects truly attractive is for anybody who's made the conversion like I have from looking at contamination in terms of concentration distribution to the rate that contamination is moving in the subsurface, which is the flux or the integrated measurement of flux is mass discharge. So I know that's uh, an emerging metric, and, and I'm happy to, to, to know that Australia is one of the leaders in this, and I'll, I'll touch on that here in a second. So a few words about flux and why it's so valuable is that measuring contaminant concentrations in a plume, which is what we try to do, you know, with monitoring wells or, or you know, better yet, with, with a, a single transect, um, that is interesting. It gives us concentrations, but that's not a good predictor of what the concentrations are going to be in a water supply well, uh, because there's typically clean water that's flowing in to a well up on the sides of the plume, but also uh, sometimes above and below the plume. So it's a disconnect. The, the, the goals of our monitoring don't allow us to judge or predict the potential impact to a supply well. And uh, if we look, though, at the rate that contaminants are migrating in the plume, that is exciting because that now gives us a framework um, to um, make predictions uh, or to measure the severity of the plume in, in terms of its ability to impact a water supply well. So that concept is mass discharge. And so contaminant mass discharge is the link that connects the plume and the water supply well. So let's take a hypothetical here. Um, and the mass being discharged out of a water supply well is the flow rate of the well times the concentration. And if you had a plume of, let's say, TCE or MTBE or whatever, um, and that's being pumped at a rate of 300 gallons per minute, which I think is a little over 1,000 liters per minute, and then that water contains 11, gra 11 and a half gram, or sorry, uh, seven grams of your contamination, you can multiply the concentration by the extraction rate, and that's the mass being discharged from the well, which is 11 and a half grams per day. So you know that somewhere within the capture zone of the well, there's at least 11 and a half grams per day getting into the aquifer. So now, armed with that knowledge, why not characterize the plumes and measure 
and calculate that same parameter, mass discharge, grams per day, kilograms per year. And then if you know the pumping rate of a real or even hypothetical future well, you can take the, that mass discharge value and just pretend that there's no attenuation. So you wanna do a worst case calculation, divide that mass discharge by the pumping rate of the well, the units of time cancel out, and you're, you're left with a, um, a conservative estimate of the maximum concentration that could be in that well. So it's a complete framework um, and it's facilitated by uh, calculations using transects, which I'll share with you here in a minute. So here's just an example, um, you know, with that 11 and a half grams per day, 300 gallons a minute, you change units and you, you get a, a, a prediction or a calculated maximum concentration. So super powerful, relevant, appropriate. And uh, this also applies to streams and rivers. It doesn't have to be a well. And the US EPA is embracing this as a framework for looking at impacts to surface water bodies. I just wish they were as enthusiastic about uh, using this framework for looking at impacts to, uh, to water supply wells. But in the US, we're pretty stuck on a concentration network net, uh, metric. I might talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and uh, I published a paper with that uh, Professor Doug McKay a long time ago, 2001, um, called Predicting the Impacts of Groundwater Contamination. And we thought, boy, this would be a really great way to prioritize cleanup because it may not be um, the well that arrives, uh, you know, la uh, it may not be the plume that arrives first that causes the problem, but since there's a cumulative mass loading to the well, maybe it's the, the plume that arrives at the later date that actually pushes things over the, uh, the limit that then requires remediation. So uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a convert to mass discharge. I think of plumes now in grams per day, not maximum concentrations. And the transect method facilitates this calculation. It's one of the recommended methods for calculating contaminant mass discharge. And it's simply by doing detailed monitoring. This is a real site in uh, Alameda Air Force Base in California with CMT multi-level wells along a transect. You take the concentrations, put them in a uh, cell in your Excel spreadsheet. You know the cross-sectional area. So you have concentration. You can estimate the Darcy flux. Um, you can then measure the air, you know the cross-sectional area because you drew it on a, on a cross-section and you just sum that up in Excel. Um, and in this case, it, it totaled 40 grams per day. That's a super meaningful, useful number. Um, so it can be expensive if you're putting in multi-level wells on, you know, at the beginning, which we did, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but there have emerged cost-saving strategies for transects, and that is to pre-characterize where you're going to put your transect with the growing number of direct push tools like cone penetrometer testing or, or geoprobes, electrical conductivity probe and membrane interface probe. And that can allow you to quickly delineate the stratigraphy and the general distribution of contamination for then subsequent um, uh, groundwater sampling and multi-level well installation. So an old photo, a more recent photo, and then at these different locations, uh, my uh, and it kudos to Geoprobe for giving me the slide. But you're you're um, allowed. You then can create a, a cross section of electrical conductivity, which is um, um, a measurement of the stratigraphy because clays are better condu conductors of electricity than sands. So I've just highlighted where the sands are in this cross section, and then the the uh, photoionization detector shows where the hot spots are within the cross section. So you can superimpose those. And then now you have some really clear targets for doing either one-time direct push sampling, um, preferably, and then deciding on locations of engineered multi-level systems. Um, Solinst and others makes um, some very useful direct push tools for doing these one-time samplers. Most drilling contractors are able to fabricate their own, uh, but there's some uh, pretty, um, pretty nice multi-level drive point pisometers that are available from Solinst. So I do definitely recommend doing this pre-characterization and then doing the first round of groundwater sampling uh, using uh, one of these direct push tools. And so I think I've mentioned this before, but time series groundwater sampling, it's essential. Um, 
it's essential to to see if the plume is if the source is is naturally depleting or if you've done some source zone remediation is it working um if you don't do repeated measurements how can you tell you can't so you can you can pony up and do a whole bunch of direct push sampling you know every 3 years every 5 years or you can um, put in engineered multi-level systems for five or 10 or 15 years and then remove them. And then that allows the, you the ability to, to collect samples over time from exactly the same depths and locations um, along transects. So EPA has come around and, you know, boy, 20 years ago now, they put out their first guidance document with a more realistic looking plume with transects. The American Petroleum Institute thought, wow, this is really great stuff. And so there's a, a guidance document from the American Petroleum Institute, um, the uh, you know National Research Council in the in the U.S. published a recent document talking about mass discharge along control planes and the the value of transects. So that's great. And then there's uh, many other early adopters globally uh, of this mass discharge framework. Germany calls it the emission-based cleanup. Uh, Canada is into it. Australia, way to go, Australia. Uh, here's a diagram from a, uh, some researchers in the Netherlands. If you're not aware of what's going on in Australia, there's at least this um, publication that advocates for uh, mass flux measurements and, and uh, measuring mass discharge along sampling transects. It's a CRC CARE document um, from, I forget the date. It's several years old, but it basically talks about transects and mass flux and recommends this mass flux toolkit with a familiar looking graphic. Um, the the Inter, uh, Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council in the US, which is becoming much, much more international, they put out a guidance document in, in 2010 on this topic. So you know you really hit the big leagues when ITRC writes a, a guidance document. And then there's even a book chapter um, edited by Bernie Cooper on chlorinated solvent source zone remediation. And the title is Flux-Based Site Assessment and Management. So it's a really important concept. It's growing in popularity slowly. I wish it was faster. And it's a, there's a real need for ongoing monitoring at select locations at multiple depths along transects. And that's where these engineered multi-level systems are really uh, unique and really valuable because you can go back to the same transect every six months or every year for five years, 10 years to see how things are changing uh, in response to either remediation or just natural source zone depletion. Here's a few publications. Uh, one of the most recent ones is this by, one by Colby Steelman at uh, University of Guelph in Canada on the importance of transects for characterizing organic contaminant plumes in groundwater. Um, and just a, just a quick little couple of slides on a case study of a complex site, fractured basalts in southeastern Idaho, a, a molybdenum and vanadium plume, and uh, the most challenging project I've ever worked on, but also the most rewarding, and uh, credit to my client at the Greenfield Environmental Trust Group. Just a few slides, and this was presented a couple of years ago at the uh, Battelle Conference in, in the U.S., a former Kerr-McGee facility, a vanadium uh, and molybdenum processing facility here with a, a release of, of molyb molybdenum and vanadium to groundwater and the creation of a, a three mile or five kilometer long dissolved plume flowing down gradient. And they received a order from the EPA to investigate the plume. Uh, here's what that plume looks like. So five kilometers from where it started, fractured basalt getting down to this town of uh, Soda Springs, Idaho, where there are water supply wells. So a pretty serious contaminant plume in a pretty nasty geologic environment. Uh, I'm happy to share this entire presentation with you, but I've just highlighted some of the innovations that we used on this project, including um, the uh, you know transects of multi-level wells. So we had uh, five different transects and we had a, we set up a shop to be building these CMT wells that were inserted into um, 50 meter boreholes that were drilled with sonic equipment. So lots of other cool stuff that we did. I can share more about that another time, but um, transects. So, um, so sampling transects, there was one there, there was one here, 
one here, one here, and uh, another one right here. And that allowed us to then draw cross sections, um, uh, you know, perpendicular to the groundwater flow direction. Again, complex geology. We used a handheld XRF meter to actually characterize the concentrations of trace metals. And we found anomalies that allowed us to uh, be very confident in correlating these different geologic units. And here you can see our multi-level wells uh, where we uh, did continuous coring with Sonic. And then, oh my goodness, we're able to then show concentrations of molybdenum at different depths with these different dots where the diameters uh, correspond to the concentrations. And you can see um, that the uh, locations and concentrations with depth of molybdenum and vanadium along the transects. That led to an understanding of um, the source term with three different um, uh, plume cores of vanadium emanating from the site and migrating down gradient. And then also a mass discharge calculation along the transects that showed that 93 to 95% of the uh, plume mass is flowing within these plume cores but uh, very confident calculations of mass flux, mass discharge, and, and really high resolution delineation of where there's re residual contamination at the site. So, uh, sorry, it's just a quick example, but complex geology, fractured basalts uh, with intercalated alluvial materials, um, continuous coring with sonic to, um, to 50 meters very quickly, um, using handheld XRF to determine the, the stratigraphy, help with the, the stratigraphy correlation, and then multi-level wells in 68 different uh, boreholes along five different transects. Excellent project. Thank you, uh, Greenfield Environmental Trust. Um, and uh, that's my case study for a complex site. Uh, I do want to acknowledge just a couple of individuals and just some new information that I think is really exciting. Uh, Jonas Garcia Rincon, who I do not know personally, but I know he's based in Australia. He um, edited this brand new book on advances in characterization and remediation of sites with petroleum hydrocarbons, but it's not just limited to petroleum hydrocarbons. It's, it's really some ver very valuable information on stratigraphic uh, methods for uh, defining the geology better. Um, there's a really excellent chapter on uh, laser-induced fluorescence by Randy San Germain and several other really great um, um, uh, chapters in this. So kudos to Jonas for this. Uh, perhaps he's on the call right now, but I think he's based in Sydney. And um, you can buy this for $49 on Amazon, or you can download it for free because it's open access <laughs> from the Springer uh, uh, website. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Bob Cleary, who's on the call from uh, Guaruja, Brazil. And Bob runs the Princeton Remediation and Princeton Groundwater Courses, where I'm an instructor. And the slides I've shared with you and the topics are just a small uh, bit of the content that I present um, twice a year in the Princeton courses. One is in person in Las Vegas, come to Vegas, or um, in the fall, it's uh, held virtually. So thank you, Bob, uh, for... Uh, for uh, allowing me to share some of these slides. And it's a, a bit of a teaser for uh, a much more comprehensive content that I, I and several other instructors give in the Princeton courses. Murray, That's, yep. just before we swap screens, I've got a question for you. Yep. So it seems to me that we've been quite dependent on groundwater modeling for sort of determining the fate of contaminants over the years. And then the data we put into them is often from these conventional wells yeah. that, you know, you've certainly cast some questions about today. So how are the sort of modelling results that are coming out um, appearing in terms of performance versus some of these sites where you've done this high resolution sure. characterization. Yeah, what you're describing is the historical evolution of dispersivity coefficients in the groundwater modeling community. Because back in the 80s, they actually, you know, well, people put in monitoring wells 
And um, and they it appeared that there was a lot of dispersion because there was blending in these long screen monitoring wells along the flow path. So the very early numerical models that were matched and fit the data from these long screen monitoring wells, they plugged in um, large dispersivity coefficients into their numerical models just to make the, the uh, models fit the data. When they started doing high resolution monitoring, especially with transects, and starting at University of Waterloo, they, the modelers realized that they had overestimated dispersivity coefficients by one or two orders of magnitude. So John Cherry published a paper on, you know, kind of the evolution of dispersivity coefficients in numerical modeling and urged the industry to, to crank down dispersivity in the models to more um, accurately reflect what's going on at real sites. So a, an unscrupulous consultant could cherry pick the uh, dispersivity coefficients from the 1980s publications, peer reviewed publications, and use those in a model to get the plume to disperse and dilute along the flow path. So sorry if I've I've uh, blown the whistle on on the on your secrets modelers in the audience, but that you know we should not be using old large dispersivity coefficients from the 1980s. So it sort of raises the question: how much information you need before you start modeling? Um, but maybe we don't get too much detail around that right now. I had a um, one more question. You had a slide up a few slides back where you'd used um, various technologies to sort of look at the stratigraphy. So it was before your case study, but it's a fairly general question, really. And um, on the basis of that information you'd collected, you've then gone with your transect data with multi-levels. Oh, yeah. Um, but one of the questions that I often get asked, you know, because we install a few of these for people, is, well, what length within like a CMT channel should we be setting? And if you looked at the data that you were collecting at the point of time of putting your monitoring well in, you might say, well, we've got these VOC readings and that sort of thing. Let's target that lens. Right. That's going to change with time, as you've shown, as it moves along. So do you base it more on the thickness of the lithology or do you base it more on the contaminant distribution you know at the time of installation? I would tend to base it more on the contaminant distribution if I've done some pre-screening with uh, like a membrane interface probe, um, because you can have a completely homogeneous aquifer and still have stratified contamination because of limited vertical mixing in that, in that aquifer. So a lot of people think that you need to have heterogeneous geology to have heter vertically heterogeneous contaminant distribution, but you you can you, you get that vertical heterogeneity even in pretty homogeneous um, materials if the if the distribution at the source is is heterogeneous. Because again, it just doesn't mix that much vertically. Um, in the old days, like 20 years ago, before membrane interface probes, I would always put in multi-level wells because, you know, why not? They're pretty cheap. Uh, leave them in for a few years, pull them out. Uh, but that changed for me personally and many others with the advent of these membrane, these direct push tools that can tell you generally where the contamination is. And then you can go in and just kind of check on that with these direct push tools. And that allows you to be really focused in where you invest your money to put in a CMT system or a Waterloo system. Very so good. that's been a change in our industry. All right, we better move but, to questions. Thanks for that. Um, Jim. I will share my screen if you stop. Yeah, please. So first up, we have our early bird questions. These are questions that came in prior to the presentation. If there are some here that we feel we've covered in the presentation, we'll just skip over them. Are there technical references peer reviewed for transport of dissolved and undissolved? Yeah, there's a lot of 
a lot of really good presentations uh, and, pep and papers. Um, I think I cover a lot of those in that book chapter. <clears throat> They're certainly described uh, in hours of lectures in the Princeton Mediation course. Um, but any of the publications, you know, that came out of the field research at Base Borden, and so John Cherry would be a co-author on probably all of those. Um, those are pretty easy to find in uh, Google Scholar, uh, or you can also use ChatGPT to basically, you know, ask that same question and see see what the responses are. But uh, Waterloo was, you know, really dominant in the 1970s and 80s. Um, Denmark, um, the Danish Technical University, they they did some really have done some really great research. Also, um, you know, certainly Australia and others too. Very good. Next question: Can the transect approach capture dynamic changes in dispersion? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that refers to, but I can, you know, imagine that you've maybe got changing flow directions. Um, you know, maybe you're near a stream or a tidally influ influenced stream or a well field where wells are going on and going off. And absolutely, you're actually measuring what's going on with the contaminant plume. Um, so, you know, if there's changes in the location of the plume or it's being or it's spreading laterally because now you now that plume is moving cross gradient, you'll measure that uh, with with transects. And you get also not just depth discrete water quality data, but you're getting um, a robust data set of of data of depth discrete head data. So that that uh, head data also um, is really valuable in understanding the groundwater flow system over time um, to maybe understand what's causing those dynamic changes in dispersion. Next question. Can you include examples of the transect approach in heterogeneous material, e.g. alluvium and fractured weathered rock? I think we have included a case study yeah. on that. Yeah, and the Waterloo system in particular has been installed at, at uh, hundreds of sites with fractured rock, uh, weathered rock. Uh, you just have to be able to use a drilling method that can create a borehole in the fractured rock. All right, next question. What sampling methods are you using for multi-level sampling? Yeah, the uh, the port, the channels and the sampling ports are smaller than conventional monitoring wells, uh, but Solenst and others have developed some small diameter pumps, um, either um, uh, these uh, check valve tubing pumps or, um, or bladder pumps or peristaltic pumps. Um, so it's there's several options for collecting groundwater samples from from pretty great depths in all of the multi-level systems because that's a key consideration. Number five, how is the transect approach addressing the plume diving and the contamination rebound issue? Well, it's a, addressing it by actually truly identifying it. So a transect, you know, where you see the plume at a certain elevation, and then you see it existing at a deeper elevation in the in the transect, the next transect further down gradient. That demonstrates conclusively that you have a diving plume. Plus, you have a whole array of depth discrete ports where you can measure the water pressure, so the hydraulic head that could substantiate that there is a reason for a plume diving. So it, it's absolutely the right technology to test that hypothesis. Number six, how long does it take the plumes to reach groundwater 100 metres below and horizontal? That must Boy, be site specific. Um, I you think know, that, right. Yeah. And it, it really depends on the geology, but groundwater can reach gr great depths very quickly if you have conduits like uh, old water wells or oil wells, or if you have fractured media, um, even glacial tills, which you probably don't have too many in Australia. They have desiccation cracks, and you can have pretty rapid vertical movement of groundwater uh, or of recharge water to the to the water table. And then, um, you know, horizontal flow of contaminants. Well, groundwater flows, you know, you know, four to you know, 10, 12 centimeters a day. Typically, it can be higher than that, but it generally flows pretty slowly but it, it depends on the gradient and the hydraulic properties. 
Next question, number seven. What type of sampling can be done on the field to plot the extent of contamination to a nearby water source, such as rivers and lakes? Yeah, um, I, I again say it's a tra it's tra multiple transects. You know, two or at least a couple, two or three, depends how far your your nearby water source is. That's exactly what we did at that at site in uh, Idaho with that uh, five kilometer long plume of metals. Um, and we know what's going on there. There's no doubt. And if you use just conventional monitoring wells, you know, in a scattered array, you would have huge doubt and uncertainty in what's going on there. So it yields conclusive results in uh, the transects and then also being able to collect samples repeatedly from the same locations along the transect. And Murray, I'm going to sneak a question in here. Sure. You know, you're very passionate about these multi-levels, but the, the world seems to be very slow to let go of these erroneous traditional wells that um, have formed. What Why do you think it's been so slow to change? A lot of this stuff uh, that you're putting forward has been known now for maybe, what, 10, 15 years? It's... Um, yeah, I think there's tradition and there's um, momentum, you know, behind the early methods. And EPA was very well funded early on and very active in, in writing guidance documents in the in the 1980s. But they stopped writing guidance documents in the 90s, either because they ran out of money or they were so controversial. And so they, you know, people still have these 1986 guidance documents on their bookshelves that recommends those uh, early style of groundwater monitoring wells. The other thing too is, you know, there's often a negative bias with those results and the negative bias isn't such bad news to some, to some property owners. Um, so, you know. Yeah, that's an interesting They reason. may not want to know how, <laughs> you know, the true concentration, you know, concentration distribution or that, you know that there much there might be a much higher concentration plume core, but the flip side of that is if you know where it is, then you can target it much more economically for for truly effective remediation, and then you can verify the performance of that remediation with a high resolution monitoring network. Thanks, Murray. Sure. We're going to move to the Q and A. We just clicked over one thirty, so thanks so much for everyone who's still here. We've got a still got a great audience. Murray, you happy to keep going for a bit longer? Yeah, of course. All right. What I do see Jonas Garcia Rincon in the audience. Kudos for that book, man. That's really awesome. All right. Well, Martin O'Rourke, a local legend. The flavor of the month these days is P H A S P F A S. I think maybe it's one of those. Does this yeah. behave the same way? Yeah. So Perfluoral alkyl substances, PFAS, um, boy, it is it is a really hot topic. I've never seen anything like it in my career um, because it's pretty ubiquitous and doesn't degrade very uh, rapidly um, in the environment. So perfluorinated compounds, you know, found in um, um, coatings that are um, resistant to oils and water in, you know, pretty much all of the food packaging we have. Um, and so it's critically important to know what the actual distribution is in the subsurface, especially for risk management. And so having um, high quality depth discrete data rather than blended samples is critically important. I'm seeing, um, it, it, I'm working on several PFAS uh, projects and I'm seeing coupling of high resolution groundwater monitoring with higher resolution VATO zone monitoring um, with um, suction lysimeters and other devices to uh, understand whether the ma residual mass is in the VATO zone or if it's in the saturated zone. Because PFAS partitions to, um, to at the air-water interfaces and also um, to layers with uh, high amounts of organic carbon. So it's a really ideal technology for PFAS site investigation. Again, it's high resolution, so it's actually meaningful and real uh, data versus, you know, putting in a, a conventional monitoring well. 
Um, Solence has done testing to show that the components of all of their sampling uh, technologies are PFAS free. And as you probably know, PFAS or Teflon is a form of PFAS. So um, Teflon is not a good um, polymer to be using in groundwater sampling um, materials any longer. All right, next question from Stephen Macon. How can you have confidence in the seal between the sampling ports in multi-level wells in a single borehole? Uh, really good question. Um, the, the immediate way that gives me confidence that I've got a good seal is if the water levels are all different in the different ports. And they usually are because there's usually vertical gradients uh, in the subsurface. It's very unusual to have no vertical gradients, to have completely vert, uh, horizontal flow. So if I see vertical gradients, I'm, I'm usually done. But if I have um, you know, a couple of ports with the same hydraulic head, I'll do a slug test. So I'll do a, a pressure test where I'll just quickly remove you know, uh, you know, 100 cc's of water from one port while I'm monitoring the two adjacent ports. And if they don't respond, then I'm pretty confident that there, there's a good seal. But if I do see an immediate response in an adjacent zone, then I'm, uh, then I'm suspicious that there's a bad seal. Next question, Jonas Garcia Rincon. It's the same question I asked you. So sorry, Jonas, but I don't think we need to go through that one again. Um, Luke Munich, great presentation, Murray, and thank you for sharing. Would you know if there are any example projects in Australia where we have used Waterloo or CMT multi-level monitoring systems and where can you get them? I can answer that one. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yes, there are lots of CMT projects and we've used them for many applications. Some of the interesting ones are, say the basalt formations in Melbourne, where we're looking at a combination of screening across fractures that are actually got vapour in them. So you're looking at the VOC distribution at different fracture sets, and then at greater depth, screening across other fracture sets where you've got water. So it provides some really nice complementary data between the right. vagus, vapour zones and the, the saturated. In the... Um, in South Australia, we've used it for salt interception scheme uh, monitoring where we've got variability in salinity down through the aquifers. Um, really interesting sorts of projects there where you're trying to intercept saline layers um, with horizontal wells, but you're trying to characterise the sites first because they spend a lot of money on those. Um, over in uh, New Guinea, we've uh, done one where we were looking at oxygen diffusion through uh, wet tailings, um, which where they try to use a wet cover to stop oxygen diffusion through uh, and potentially acidifying the tailings. Uh, and in that instance, we actually sampled through the channels using handheld little oxygen meters, um, which was an interesting application. But I would have thought there's been at least 30 uh, CMT projects in Australia. Where can you get it from? We get it from HydroTerra. <laughs> so we uh, on our website, you'll find all the details and um, we're experienced with how they're installed and we've undertaken some installations ourselves. So please get in touch. Um, that's probably enough of a plug. Hey, Richard, a, a suggestion, of, you know, for you and your colleagues and people who are still on the call. Um, Australia is a leader in contaminant hydrogeology. You've got great universities, great research institutes. I think you have the flexibility to be pushing the envelope and taking different approaches. I just don't understand the resistance. And I, maybe I do understand it, but it's the the United States is a big country and it, it's hard to change the direction of the ship as it's sailing. And it's, I don't understand why multi-level monitoring, which is a form of high resolution temporal monitoring, because you can go back to those transects over and over again, why that's not a, an essential element of, of the, the site characterization and monitoring toolkit in the United States. And in Australia, perhaps with you know your colleagues and universities and Jonas Garcia Rincon's ability to write really great books and guidance documents, perhaps we should all be thinking about 
pushing the envelope in Australia to really take the lead in um, in you know this approach of transex with multi-level systems to to allow that higher resolution temporal monitoring, which is completely missing in the United States. What do you think? I think uh, it's a, it's, it would be a great initiative, and and I do think we do have some um, forums where they are pushing the envelope. So the Australian Land and Groundwater Association says is a really proactive organisation and they yeah. have a um, working group that was all about um, high resolution site characterization and we actually um, presented there on CMT. But I think that some of the, the ways forward are actually to develop more collaborative approaches involving the regulators and the EPA accredited auditors because um, in the end the assessors in Australia sort of need to keep those auditors ultimately happy because they're signing off. So the auditors need to be understanding and buying into those right. technologies for characterising. So I think maybe a step forward just off the top of my head would be to facilitate some kind of way of bringing those parties together along maybe with the ALGA sort of forum to say, hey, let's move forward in and, and get consensus around this technology approach because it would be very easy to continue with the status quo and uh, be getting it sort of wrong more often. So, yeah, I'm very much in your camp on the passion around it. But um, something that I'll take on board and maybe circulate, that's one thing Hydrature is lucky to have this platform to we've had like Victorian EPA applied sciences group on here before and other other organizations like that yeah. so that we can help facilitate I would have thought ALGA's the home for it though um would be my gut feel so ALGA's Australian Land and Groundwater right. Association I'm happy to introduce you if you want to get involved with that forum I suspect you're quite sure. busy already though but if you want I'll introduce you and uh, CRC Care is another one that has driven driven a fair right. bit of that. I saw one of their publications. Um, so, yeah, happy to introduce to some of these people. Um, next question from Darwit Bekel. Have I got that right? What is the applicability of this technique in terms of PFAS contamination? The dispersivity of PFAS is challenging due to multiple interferences with water chemistry and aquifer properties, as well as the absence of dispersivity parameters, adsorption values, etc. Yeah, I'd say it's um, it's absolutely the best technology for understanding what's really going on uh, if you compare it to the alternatives, which are long screen monitoring wells. So it's being used at many, many sites, uh, PFAS release sites and in transects um, because um, it's important to know the true distribution which can be measured with these transects. And then measuring the head, head changes too, is the plume gonna be diving or, or, not, or, um, or not? You can infer that from, from the head distribution. So what I think we're going to see soon, um, and I've talked with Solons about this quite a bit, but um, Vedosone monitoring was very popular in the 1980s because it was required at solid waste landfills in the country. But when the EPA dropped that requirement, people stopped doing uh, Vedosone monitoring with suction lysimeters and tensiometers. And I call that Vedosone 1.0. But because of PFAS, I think we're in an era of Vedosone 2.0, uh, and there's a lot, there's many research projects going on right now uh, where there's there's high resolution monitoring in the Vedosone, and I think it's an opportunity for technology developers to update the the tools and technologies for Vedosone monitoring in this new era of concern about PFAS and other emerging contaminants. Okay, another question from Darwin. Is the well screen length critical parameter to have high resolution vertical 
concentration delineation. What is your opinion on multiple level discrete samplers, e.g. snap samplers on a long screen versus nested groundwater well with short screen? Right. Um, so a snap sampler is a type of uh, device that can go down a long screen well and collect a sample. If you remember that image that I showed early in my pres presentation with the vertical flow of contaminants in a well, because, it, because there's no resistance to vertical flow in the well, then putting, you know, trying to collect samples with a snap sampler or a hydro sleeve or a diffusion bag sampler or low flow purging, it's a fool's errand, you know, because you, all you're sampling is the water that's coming into the well from the portion of the aquifer that has the highest pressure and it's flowing up or down or both in the well. So it's it's not recommended practice to use devices, those devices in conventional long screen monitoring wells. Even though a lot of people do it and think it's meaningful, it it I don't think it is most of the time. Good. And then a, you know, a screen length for a, a multi-level well, you know, a meter at the most, you know. 50 centimeters is pretty good distance. That's typical of the kind of the sampling zone for a multi-level system. If it's too short then you and you risk putting it opposite a clay unit maybe because you're off on your depths a little bit and you're logging. Um, so most people want to have a little more comfort by by putting it, you know, not, you know, 15 centimeters, but maybe, you know, 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters. I'm just reflecting. 100 some, meters. Uh, reflecting on some wells we put in where, <laughs> not wells we put in, but. Uh, hey, Richard, we all did it, man. <laughs> no, no, this is the coal seam gas sector where, you know, you've got an open hole section of 300 meters and you're taking a very small sample out of some part of that. Yes. Um, I'll move on. Stephen Parsons, if you are not concerned with remediation and more concerned with off-site risk assessment, is there an argument that results of multi-depth sampling from a long screened well is still appropriate for mass flux calculations because the mixing within the well is ultimately summed to an integrated flux anyway? Um, I think that's partially true, but I just, every, anytime somebody says that, or anytime I think that might be the case, my mind goes back to that image of the plume flowing vertically in a well and being strongly biased by the, the ambient vertical flow within a well. Um, so I think it's difficult to get a, a truly blended sample from a well unless you pump it. And then you can start getting, a, you know, physical blending and overcoming that ambient vertical flow within the wells. Um, if I was doing a property site assessment and I just needed to know, you know, is there something at this location and maybe even estimating the mass discharge, I would, and I just needed to do it for a property transfer, a, you know, a due diligence study, I would probably do direct push sampling um, and not put in a, um, you know, a, a transect of engineered multi-level monitoring systems because I'm not going to have to monitor them over time. And so you can you can not bear that expense by, um, by using the one-time direct push samples. But if you're monitoring over time, especially over years, you know, it's going to be more economical to invest in a in these engineered uh, transect of the engineered CMTs or Waterloo system or something else or clusters of wells. Um, because it's easy to go back to them repeatedly and take measurements and samples. Next question from Stephen Cambridge. Great presentation, thanks. I just gotta move it down, it's all right. Hey Richard, one idea I had while well, we've been talking. So Bob Cleary I know is on the call. Um, he's down in Brazil. In the, at the moment, but he runs the Princeton courses and he's given courses all around the world. Um, and I don't know if he can answer now, but it could be an idea to offer the, the uh, groundwater pollution and or the Princeton remediation course in Australia, either in person or virtually. 
because that really is the most comprehensive week-long course on modern contaminant hydrogeology. Just uh, throwing it out there, because well, I'd like to go to Australia. <laughs> now we're getting to the nub of it. Well, how about send the details through and we'll see what we can do to facilitate Murray. I think that uh, um, we do have the Centre for Groundwater Studies here in Australia right. and uh, a collaborative effort to uh, work on training would make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I'm happy to facilitate and of course, I can't speak for Bob Cleary, but uh, that's that's uh, one of the beauties of these webinars, Murray. Yeah, <laughs> um, we'll assume that you've got the nod. Um, Stephen Cambridge, have I read that one? Great presentation. Thanks. Does the elongated contaminant plume you showed in the early slides only occur in sandy aquifers, and do you see more lateral spreading of contaminants? And co-mingling with other plumes in fine-grained aquifers such as silty clay aquifers. Yeah, there is definitely more mixing and complex um, fingering of plumes in heterogeneous strata. Um, but even with that said, like our site at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is pretty heterogeneous and stratified um, alluvial deposits, we we were pretty surprised to see those plumes migrating in in pretty straight ar arrays and, and maintaining their thin dimensions, um, even in uh, complex alluvial strata. But it definitely imparts a uh, constraint or architecture that, that affects the fluid migration. Okay, another one from Stephen Parsons. How can hydraulic conductivity determination be undertaken at each, excuse me, at each sample interval in a multi-level system? I guess we're talking about slug tests. Yeah, um, they can be done and have been done. And there's a publication by somebody, I'm forgetting his name, at Water University of Waterloo, who did develop different well functions to, be, to use in the analytical solutions for slug tests for CMT wells. Um, because again, it's, it's a, a section of a pie, it's not the full radius of the well that's seeing that pressure pressure change. So um, there are some um, some variations in analytical methods to use CMT and other multi-level systems. And I, I think Solens could provide those publications or the citations to those publications. Getting back to your earlier question about running a lecture ser series down here at Princeton, course um alga has run various forums like they did a two-day um, high resolution characterization thing up in sydney um a few years ago now but maybe something like that could have a guest lecturer down too so yeah. it's another option now we've got another couple of questions here johannes you dig go Great presentation. How about upstream transect sampling for site investigation? Elevated oh, great, great question. I'm sorry I didn't talk about that. I work a lot in industrial areas in the United States, and probably half of the projects I work on, they're, the contamination beneath my client's property is from an upgradient source. So, um, you know, there's a plume from one site and it flows onto and beneath another site. And so a transect at the upgradient edge of a property is really smart and um, can often identify trespassing and, and in, encroachment of contaminants from an upgrading property. So yeah, thank you for that question. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's very common and that's a perfect use, a really valuable use for a transect of probably direct push samples um, because you need that resolution to make sure there's nothing come on, onto the site. You can't just go out and do one sample, you know, because you might miss that plume because the plumes can be skinny and thin. So just that approach for the transects, you know, the pre-screening with the direct push tools and then maybe direct push sampling, if you can, can do that, uh, would be really a very smart thing to do. And I've done that on a lot of projects. <clears throat> 
All right, last question. You've done very well, Murray. This one's from Alison Reynolds. I know the US DOE LM team, you might know better what that stands for, Murray, um, has found that VADO zone can function as a secondary source as metals are released and deposited as the gram water table fluctuates. How would you choose to capture these variations, particularly with the cost of direct push programs? Um, I would, that's, a, that's the advantage of a, a multi-level system like a CMT system is uh, it could be at least in the saturated zone and the, and the capillary fringe, um, it, you can have close spacing between your monitoring zones and measure concentration gradients, measure pressure gradients that um, are at that interface. And, and so high resolution monitoring right at the interface, the capillary fringe, the top of the water table, um, that's a, a very, a very kind of useful micro environment for doing that high resolution monitoring. You can also use suction samplers if you're wanting to get samples right. out of the unsaturated zone. Right. There's those things that Centec make, the sort of ceramic head on them that you can put a vacuum on and come back in a week and collect the samples. Um, well, thanks, Murray, and thank you very much to the audience. Um, great questions there today. Really appreciate everyone involved. And uh, in particular, Murray, really, really good presentation. So thank you very much good. for your time today. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.